that a little bit? Sure, I mean, the biggest, um, I think, difference for me is that as an artist or writer, um, the immediacy with which you have an audience with the internet, um, it's just so much different than like, um, you know, as a poet in my younger, much younger years, um, before it was sort of like, before I was doing a lot of online publishing, it was much more like sort of home with like head and oven, you know, writing, writing slowly and, um, and now um, it's more of a, the audience is right there. Um, and because of that, dis because of that, I've actually kind of made a distinction, which like some people will call my Twitter account poetry, um, but I actually um, don't. And I don't know why I do that, but with my poetry, poetry, I like to, um, I prefer to not uh, use anything so time sensitive. Like I want something that is more eternal um, because I think that's a direct reaction to so much of my life being spent online where like in some ways things are eternal. I mean like a, a search term, you know, a web page will live, can live forever. Um, but at the same time, um, the turnover is just so fast um, that I think when it comes to poetry, it's like, I don't know, I want more space for like contemplation and also um, so maybe something that just won't be thrown away so quickly. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, John, do you find that there's something ephemeral about um, language online that is not, um, that doesn't hold for? Um, no, no, I don't. I don't find it ephemeral at all, especially since the nature of the medium is such that there's a certain permanence about it. I see the time that we're in as a linguistic improvement over the way things were before, although it's hard to feel it within our short lifespans and seeing the changes happening at such a dizzying speed. And so, for example, imagine this space, say, 150 years ago. It may have been this building, for all I know. No, it wasn't this building. But this space, you can imagine probably Edgar Allan Poe was here. Let's say something was going on here that involved language. If we could go back to that time, one thing that we would find odd is how arid the linguistic culture would have seemed because if you spoke, you were expected to speak in a high oratorical style. You were supposed to use remarks. All of us would have notes with us instead of just going blind the way we're doing it now. And if you wrote something, you were expected to write in tapeworm sentences, Henry James, could have a career. And that was all, really, that there was. There was very little room for speaking in a vernacular way and having it considered artful, except for the narrow realm of maybe a certain kind of quaint vernacular performance. You might write the way a working class Irish person spoke in a book, or there might be a book of verse, but that was it. Today, we have a much richer culture, because, for example, in addition, to speaking in a formal way, although actually the space for that in the culture has narrowed considerably. It's considered artificial to speak too well. The fact is, with spoken word poetry, and especially rap, vernacular language used artfully now makes money and is part of the culture. You can't say that America has no poetry because America has rap. Then in the meantime, all of these things we're seeing online is chaotic, and as variegated as it can look. What that is, is vernacular writing occupying a space in the public square. And so now you can write the way you talk and we can reflect all the complexities and the nuances and the jokes in the way we talk in print. And all of this is vernacular and spontaneous and it's hot and it's messy because that's what speech has always been. But we can do that in a way that was virtually impossible in, say, 1980. So that means that we have a richer linguistic culture than we had 125 years ago. We have a richer linguistic culture than we had 20 years ago. I think it's all fantastic myself. Yeah, just to push back a little bit, though, um, if we, <laughs> and I'm not sure, I'm playing devil's advocate because I'm not sure I hold this opinion, yeah, but um, if we already talk the way we talk, then how is it a broadening or an expansion to now start writing the way we talk, too. 
because when you're writing the way you talk, you're, you're making it better because you can look back and fix things and you can affect things. So for example, if you write in all caps, you're not yelling, you're yelling. There's an irony in it. If you really yell in writing, the last thing you're going to do is use those rather funny capital letters. So it's artful speech written down. We couldn't do that when we were children. I love it. So do you think that the, the, <laughs> the irony, I mean, people talk about internet speak, which we know is not a monolith, but when people sort of try to describe it as one thing, they say it's tinged with irony. That's sort of its prevailing characteristic. Um, and it's interesting to think that maybe that irony comes from the necessary gap between speech and writing. When you translate speech to the page or to the screen, there is going to be something lost and something gained, and it's not a one-to-one -one thing. And so maybe the irony comes in to sort of signal awareness of that sort of uh, slight disjunc disjunction. That's my next book. Yes, I mean, okay. the whole idea that we think of ourselves as more ironic than people in the past, we're trained to think that couldn't be true, but I'm beginning to think it is true. And the question becomes why, and a lot of it has to do with exactly that disjunction between print and speech, which we now negotiate all day long every day. It makes us a different kind of person um, coming to suspect. Yes, there was irony in 1925, but there was a different kind. There's something about modern language that I think bears looking into. As you can see, I started working on this about 10 minutes ago, but <laughs> I can't get off of it. I'm going to be persistent. Well, that self-consciousness, the sort of the self-awareness, we, we certainly see that um, reflected all the time in you know, social media and other online discourse. Um, and it, what's interesting is that, you know, um, this is something John has talked about in the past too, you know, that gap that you're talking about between text and speech and, and how we make up for the fact that um, we are, you know, having a, something that's like speech but in a textual form, but we're missing things and we make up for that in various ways. And what are we missing? All this, this sort of non-linguistic or what are sometimes called paralinguistic features, things that go along with language. So the things that we do in terms of our gestures, our, you know, our, uh, what we do with our face and our tone of voice and all the rest that might be lost and, and how can we make up for that through uh, a little uh, hashtag or emoji or something like that uh, which can you know, help to present a certain kind of stance, an attitude. And it, it very often is a distancing kind of stance. It's like, I'm saying this, but now I'm going to pull back a little. I might be a little sort of self-effacing about it. In a way, it's, it's almost uh, like a preemptive strike because people can so easily ridicule you and I'm, I'm going to do it to myself first by, you know, putting on a, you know, using a, a hashtag or emoji that, you know, indicates that. Um, and so, as John was saying, I mean, there, 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 are, um, there are ways that we sort of uh, are immediately ironicizing ourselves and our speech. And it's, it's fascinating to watch because um, we do it to ourselves and then we do it to other people and there's this kind of interchange that happens where um, you know, where a particular linguistic turn of phrase, for instance, may pop up, and then it seemingly almost immediately now, it can get sort of recontextualized, resignified um, in all these different ways and sort of shot through with all these different voices that are giving their own stances on it. So there's, you know, th and that, that ha can happen immediately. I mean, we see it happening, for instance, with political language. And there are plenty of examples we could talk about from the from the campaign. It's Hillary Clinton says the word deplorables and within hours deplorables means something quite different when, from uh, what she meant it. It's a, and, or on the other side when uh, Donald Trump says nasty woman or bad hombres. Um, <laughs> so there's this kind of re-signification that's happening so quickly. I mean it's uh, like you know within hours of a public figure saying something you can get it on an ironic t-shirt. So <laughs> Um, that, you know, that process of, you know, uh, has been so accelerated that we come to expect it. I mean, everything is already on its surface ironic somehow, and you have to peel through those layers of irony to really understand it, if you ever do. And it's preserved. And so in terms of history, the fact that we are actually getting in this at least relatively permanent form, these new expressions that come in means that we'll be able to know 
how we talked in the future in a way that it's sobering how little we can now. So for example, Film Forum ran a silent film from 1920, I believe, six, about a year ago. It was about a flapper. It was called Be Yourself. And you think, well, okay, be yourself means that she's going to realize herself and be honest about herself. And you can't help thinking, that's a little, little present for a film in 1926. Be yourself. Why do they call it that? I did some digging around, Ben. I don't know if, if you found this expression. Be yourself in the 20s meant, ah, oh, be yourself, as in get real. That's something that people said. I found it in two things. Somebody saying, ah, be yourself. But frankly, the people who said it, are dead or close to it, and it's not something that you would find in any slang dictionary. I just found it by accident because I'm strange. And the fact is that in the film, because it's silent, you're watching people talking, what were they saying? They didn't sound like Fitzgerald novels. They didn't talk in full sentences any more than most of us do. What were they saying? We don't know. They're gone. Everybody's going to know what we were saying. I find that thrilling, even if I'm not here to see it. Yeah, I want to jump on the be yourself catchphrase um, <laughs> because something that really fascinates me about your work is that um, you use irony and the sort of hedging of internet language, or you have not maybe so much in your most recent book, but you have used that um, self-consciousness to ironically show authenticity, like mm -hmm. the idea that everything is behind seven veils means that you are actually more present and more more real um, than you might otherwise be if you hadn't sort of used that system of codes. Um, and I wonder if maybe you could take us inside how that works or whether that was intentional or whether that even makes sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's just dark humor. You know, I think it's um, like, what, is, what do they say? Humor is suffering plus time. Mm -hmm. um, so. There's not much time, actually. There's, there's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot faster. You know, from, from, mind, from bad idea to tweet is a lot faster than um, from bad idea to mailing a letter used to be. Um, or from bad idea to, um, you know, video. Um, bad idea to tweet is pretty fast. Um, and I think, actually, in some ways, that can make for some of um, the most, like, primal um, immediate language, but I think, or it can, it can make for, like some of the best writing and some of the worst writing, you know, um, that songs, that editorial filter. Um, but in terms of the way irony plays with being oneself, um, I feel like if I make something humorous, I can get away with more to some extent. Like I can tell more of the truth about myself it's less scary to tell the truth about myself if there's irony. But it's interesting that we've been talking about irony as um, this result of um, sort of things shifting into, into a more textual basis and then and like not being able to read someone's body language. Because I feel like um, what, are some of the, what are some of the things that we've had to do to convey irony now, now that we lack? Because often I feel like when you send a text message, you know, the irony can be lost. And so we have to be um, more explicit in our irony, you know, and hence emojis. Those will serve to be like, only kidding. Or, um, or um, I've seen like people will put aster asterisks next to um, certain words. You know, like there's indicators. And I found myself even um, LOLing too much. Like sometimes I'll just get in like an LOL spiral of like LOL death and like, I'm texting with someone and just like everything is LOL. And like instead of saying yes, even things that are not funny at all, I've been crying and texted LOL actually just to kind of take the pressure off of having to be like a human being having feelings, you know, and risking saying something vulnerable. So I guess, um, so I don't know. I think like it's a question, like maybe we, we do have more irony now, but like is our humor more... Um, Stupid, or um, I don't know what's what's a way to say it. You guys are the you're the linguists. I don't think our humor is more stupid, but I think that obvious. It's not only the irony; it's yeah. also just the transcriptional honesty. If you yeah. listen to 
most conversations, we laugh and giggle much more than we might assume. It's a social easing. It's a little, you know, they're little martinis that you stick in between every couple of sentences. For somebody who never laughs, doesn't do all of that meaningless giggling, that's an indication that they don't like you, really. It's part of being a person. If you were going to make a robot seem real, the robot would have to learn to do all of this senseless laughing that we all do. LOL is just that. It basically comes in exactly where you would go, huh? And it means that you're actually transcribing the way people actually talk. It's wonderful. We don't know how Eleanor Roosevelt talked, but we know how we talk. She went, uh -huh, but we never get to see it. I also feel like there's with LOL, like if, if I'm texting with someone, if I'm in, in an internet chat with someone, let's say, a, a chat room, I'm never in a chat room, but let's pretend, you know. I didn't really even knew what that was, but I, go ahead. It was, a, it was a strange place. Like I feel like bad things happened in there. You could tell. Yeah. yeah, stayed out. Dark, yeah. Bad things happen. But um, I feel like LOL can kind of, I mean, the amount of LOLs t that equate to even someone, I mean, laughing out loud, forget it, but like even just a huh? Like I wonder how many LOLs to huss, like what's the ratio? Because I almost feel like LOL is a way of soothing someone else too, like I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying, even if it's like I want you to go away. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. It's like a little, a Tums pill. I don't know why I thought of that, but it's for the conversation. Yeah. But yeah, or yeah, but I mean, again, it sort of takes the place of certain yeah uh, ways that we sort of lubricate our conversation and make it make it easier. And and um, you know, linguists talk about sort of the phatic function, P H A T I C, where where all you're talking about the function that where we're using language just to sort of open a channel, maintain the channel, let you know I hear what you're saying. I all am not means. right, um, and then you know. So, so all of that, uh, that thing, those things that we do just naturally in terms of turn taking and a conversation that we do face to face, we find these new ways of expressing it. Whether it's LOL or just a K for OK, which is you know generally just the a death blow. That's <laughs> like yeah, I'm, I'm told that, that that's the angry one, right? Well, it depends. I mean, you know, th this this isn't some monolithic. You know, kind of usage. I mean, in certain, in certain, uh, you know, subcultures, you know, that K could be, you know, let's say dating. I don't know. Um, that could be that could be a very sort of you know difficult thing to deal with. What does that K mean? When it's just, uh, could you just pick up the stuff from the store on your way home? K. You know, it's like I heard what you said. I'm not disagreeing with it. I understand. There's no problem here. You need a reaction from me. I'm providing one. Over and out. Over and out. Roger that. <laughs> you, don't, you don't smell a little bit of, well, if I must in that K? Well, well in that exact situation, if I got back the K, it would be, well, why didn't you pick up the cereal? <laughs> That's a lot to read right. into a K, but OK. <laughs> well, so K period, I think, would be Oh, the period. Real, yeah. I mean, yeah. if that, you're going to bother to punctuate your text, right. like, you are feeling <laughs> some feelings, I think. Yeah. Um, Recently, I had an experience where um, I wasn't sure if someone was mad at me, and I and the last text they had sent had a period, and I was like, shit, that like it's yeah. on. But then I looked back, and every single one of their texts, even when we were in like lovely times, had been ended with a period. So it's it's a very it's not a nice thing to do to a person. That sounds like a sitcom plot. <laughs> Well, I think it's also hard because it, it has changed so fast. I remember when I first started texting, it's, oh, how do I make sure that people know that I'm joking? Like, what emoji or what um, jokey things can I include? So JK. That, that's what yeah. But now it's like, how do I let people know I'm serious? So it's like, I am mad at you. And they're like, oh, well, haha, I hate you too. I'm like, no, I'm really mad at you. <laughs> like, that was terrible. <laughs> um, so I guess maybe the solution to that is like, don't have those freighted conversations over text, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's hard. It's a jungle. What happened to email is a question. There was a time when one could write long emails, and it was considered normal. I would say that time, I think of yellowtail wine being fashionable. <laughs> it was around when blogs were just <laughs> coming out, and there was no kale, and you could still <laughs> You could write emails. And somewhere around 06 or 07, you started getting very brief responses to long emails. And I learned nobody wants them anymore unless they're over a certain age. I mean, I'm 51. My sense is that people about 65 and over still don't mind. But other than that, I've learned nobody wants a long email. 
It seems texting replaced it, but it means you can say less. Am I getting old and feeling that way? I think the actual correlation here is uh, kale. So <laughs> it's not texting, it's kale. <laughs> now kale we just have e kale. E yeah. Email has become e kale. It's the tipping point. Yeah. <laughs> I remember this. Ben, what, what about you on that? Didn't you used to write long emails? Yeah, I, you know, there's definitely been a shift, and um, yeah, it's 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 fascinating to see how something like you know email, which seems so cutting edge, you know, 20 years ago or whatever, now seems old fashioned, now seems quaint, now seems like something you would associate with, um, you know, uh, Sandra Bullock on the net or something, you know, that the <laughs> some like <laughs> old fashioned idea of what we do online. Sleepless in Seattle. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, I think that's, that's definitely, if we're looking to the future, I mean, that, that, sh that shift is ongoing. And um, certainly when uh, people are now these days looking for more secure forms of communication that won't somehow get hacked, um, email seems, you know, even less of an appealing thing to, uh, as a mode of communication. Um, but, you know, it, it's uh, certainly, you know, certainly texting has taken its place in many ways. Um, but you know, it, it's also it's also I think just the sort of the short form communications that we have, whether it's text messaging or you know tweeting and various other things. Um, in some ways, we expect more of that kind of rapid fire, you know, call and response type of communication. And uh, to the extent that I get emails, very often they look like that now. Um, and uh, and so I think there are certain expectations that are changing. It's like. Uh, we're, we should be able to say what we need to say in this very concise format. Um, and, um, you know, obviously there are sort of more long form explorations and things, but in terms of just sort of everyday uh, communication, um, so in some ways we, we may have sort of stripped down a lot of the bells and whistles. Um, we're not necessarily so concerned with, you know, how do I start this email? How do I end this email? How do I address this person? We could just go straight into the message without even having a, you know, dear so-and-so or hi so-and-so or whatever, um, because that's just more the expectation now. Um, and, you know, we don't, don't, need, no, don't need to figure out a sign off either, you know? Um, and so obviously there are situations when you're dealing with someone that you're not necessarily comfortable with, um, where there might be a certain power dynamic, say between a, professor and a student and things like that where these sorts of issues become sort of more fraught um, in how you sort of um, craft this message. But for the most part, when we're dealing with people in our surroundings, people that we're familiar with, we can dispense with a lot of that. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that seems to be one ongoing trend that we're witnessing. I mean, would you relate this to sort of the the onrush of information that we're all experiencing now, like we need a more compressed way to communicate with each other because there's just so much out there. I remember I was, I was reading a little bit about, um, I think this guy was writing in the mid 90s, um, but he was saying that instead of sort of savoring um, language online, we are hunting for information sense. And so we kind of ruthlessly scan the page and we think, what can we extract from this and then move on to the next thing? And if we don't get a cent, then we're off to the next thing and you have lost our interests, goodbye forever. Um, and so I do wonder whether um, this is a matter of information overload as opposed to just changing more is for no reason. Yeah, um, we do have an information overload or at least a whole lot more than there once was. I can distinctly remember, say, 1995, what I read from physical magazines and newspapers. I did not feel that there was too much. I wanted to read more than I ever could read, but there was more time to, I hate to say it, but to look up and smell the roses. Now, with the endless temptation of the devices that all four of us are going to be looking at as soon as we step off of that stage. Yes, it's harder to read a book. It's harder to read a long New Yorker article. And there's just so much that we can learn from the 100 things that we look at every day. Now, I think we can idealize the extent to which any of us were truly taking in all of that long form literature before. So for example, yes, you would sit and read a mile long article in the Atlantic about this, that, or the other thing. But 
I don't know, but how many people were really reading the whole article and how much were we retaining of all of that? All of that may have been a sort of Victorian artifice that was hanging on. Maybe the fact that we're all now living in a village where we're communicating in short overlapping bursts all the time and increasingly reading in that way. Maybe it's more natural and maybe in the end we're not losing anything is my tendency. But there's a part of me that misses that you could curl up with something not so long ago and there was nothing to look at on your phone. You know, that wouldn't have made any sense. It's harder and harder. I will never again write a book longer than about 180 pages because I just assume I wouldn't want to read a book longer than this. I know I can't hold their attention. And I've learned more and more lately that spoken forms get to more people than anything that's on a page because people carry their earbuds around. That's not, it's not going to change. But it is, it's dislocating how quickly all of this has happened, very much so. I mean, Ben, you are a, you're a scholar of these, of these trends, um, but I wonder if you have actually absorbed any of them as a, as a writer and a columnist for the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Well, it's funny. I mean, the, you know, I, I tend to write in these, you know, 500 word bursts or 1000 word bursts, um, just because um, that's kind of the, the format that I've inherited. And, and, you know, it continues to be a useful one. You can, you can keep people's attention for, for that, for that length if you're sort of writing a, a newspaper column length. Um, and so, you know, I do, I do find though that, um, you know, extending beyond that into longer form things, um, sometimes, yeah, sometimes I do find that um, I've trained myself to write, you know, this particular length and get, you know, one sort of coherent message out and then you're done, you're on to the next thing. So the way that people are consuming things, um, you know, with this kind of information overload, you might pick, you know, one article to read or, you know, one, one message and then you're on to the next thing. Um, yeah, I, I would say I would say that in some ways that sort of informs my approach. But I've always been sort of short attention span anyway, where where um, you know I want to sort of focus you know very intensely on one particular say word in the news or you know language issue people are talking about, um, and then move on to the next thing. Um, and so, if anything, I would say yes that with social media and everything that that um, leads to this um, this kind of uh, you know people just focusing on one thing for, you know, a flurry of attention and then moving on to the next thing. Um, that's probably encouraged some of my bad habits in terms of, <laughs> in terms of that, having that short attention span. And I, you know, I'm finding, I'll go back and read columns that I wrote a year ago or two years ago and think, oh yeah, I completely, you know, it's already passed out of my memory. Um, because, you know, it's like, that's what we were talking about. I was, I was actually just, uh, talking to, um, I used to write for the Boston Globe uh, before I wrote for the Wall Street Journal and I was catching up with my former editor, Amanda Katz, and we were reminiscing about 2012 when, um, uh, when I wrote for the Boston Globe and my most popular column by far was the one that I wrote about YOLO. And <laughs> that was a big thing in 2012 and here we are five years later, it's a YOLO. Was that really? <laughs> that Remind me, what, what is that one? <laughs> My students use it. What is it? You only live once. Yes, that's yes. right. Yeah. Okay, see. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, but it, it, these these things have such a short, uh, you know, shelf life. Very often, um, where you know, just looking back on something like from that from five years ago, um, just seems like an eternity. Yolo. <laughs> is it still current? Can no, I, can see, I do by it? the end of no. 2012, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it, 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 you know, there was a Drake song that featured it and it got this flurry of popularity in early 2012. When I wrote about it in the summer of 2012, was young people Drake? were already sick of it. Uh, and anybody over the age of 20 what, didn't even know what it meant. So there was this weird, you know, age divide that had happened. Um, but then, you know, people like Katie Couric started using it and, and it was definitely dead at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like that whole process that happens, that kind of churn, just, you know, happens, you know, faster and faster now where, you know, obviously things like slang terms always have this, you know, um, you know what's, what was popular 
last week might not be popular this week. You know, these sort of, um, it just like fashion, it sort of can change very quickly. But it just feels like social media now allows that churn to happen even faster so that you missed yesterday's meme, too bad. Or, it's, or it, by the time you get to it, it's now layered in so many, you know, layers of irony that you have to sort of peel apart if you sort of, you know, missed this sort of ongoing um, development and, and uh, the, the birth and death of a, of a particular meme or turn of phrase. Remember how important the hashtag seemed in, say, 2012, all those articles that people like you and me had to write or, or read and how students would write papers about it? Well, now that's kind of passe. Well, I wouldn't say passe. It's being used, but is it as interesting as we, we thought it was? I don't know. I mean, I, I, think, I think it, it perhaps had a, had a certain peak, but these things often go in cycles, so. You I never think know. there's also a sort of like in-group, out-group thing that gets right. created. Like, I remember when I first went on Twitter, I didn't know what the hashtag was. And it was weird, like people, everyone was using it, and I felt very um, estranged. And I was like, it, why, is a, why is there a pound sign or like a waffle? Like, I kept seeing it as the waffle. waffle. Like, I, I thought, it, I kept like picturing it as the waffle. And same with like, um, the sideways when you do a heart that's like the less than sign and then the three. I was like, why is everyone saying less than three? Like, I just did not understand. Um, and then, but sometimes there will be a, um, there'll be something like, like language or like a term that'll come up um, on Twitter and like, I feel like it's something, like I take a long time to actually Google it. Like I resist Googling it, but then finally there's like a moment where it's like, you know, I have to. And it's always like the dumbest origin, you know, but it seemed so mysterious and like you are not of the moment unless, like the most recent one was I think the, well maybe not most recent, but the Dr. Phil um, girl, there was a, a girl on Dr. Phil and she was like, what did she say, cash me outside? Cash me outside, yeah. Like it was like. Is that a couple weeks ago? Yes. I never knew what that was. I didn't have time to check it out. It's right. good that you, yeah. So, and when I saw it, I was like, this is where it came from? You know, because like people I like really like and respect are all, I'm like, oh, I really have to find out the origin story of this cashmere set. And I was like, it's a doctor, like it was very strange. So um, sometimes it is, it's a little sad to peel back the layers, What's actually. What's that name? Cash me. Cash me outside, it was like. Do I want to know? Like, like just like, come fight me outside. Oh, so that's what but that she was like singing to her mom. Okay. Yeah. Right. right. I remember. So, but you know, people, people really, they really took to it. Yeah. I mean, I think a similar experience I had last week was everyone was mad about pineapple pizza. Was that, was that just me? It was two weeks ago. Okay. I'm sorry. You were a little dating slow myself, on that one. Yeah, I saw that on Facebook. I didn't understand. No. <laughs> Why were they angry? I, I think they found it objectionable that people would put pineapple on their pizza, which seems like a strange hill to die on, but also something that was settled many, many years ago. We are an, as an affluent society. Thing to do. Wow. <laughs> but it is, you can feel kind of nice standing outside of time and saying, I have no idea why the kids are talking about pineapple pizza. I don't know what this set of letters or this acronym means. And yet, I live, yet I persist, and I, I move on, <laughs> and it's okay. Um, thirsty? That's what poetry is for me. <laughs> What's thirsty? I heard somebody the other day say thirsty, and I could tell it did not involve water. That's, is that newish? Well, somebody Pony said, and desperate. I'm all thirsty. What was she talking about? <laughs> I really don't know what it means. It definitely came up in the American Dialect Society Word of the Year voting about two or three years ago. Yeah, yeah. As sort of a Is that old? Well, <laughs> I don't know what that means. I'm sure it has even older, you know, precursors. But um, yeah, to be sort of uh, un um, desperate, thank you, sort of wanting something in an unseemly way or just, you know, um, you know seeming, it's more, it, often it's about appearances, I would say, you know, just sort of like, you know, um, does it mean horny? Desperately horny. Horny, okay. oh. hornily so desperate. Is that what it means? I mean, I think you can be thirsty about like your what career. You, you can be thirsty oh. about ambition, but I think the yeah. standard use, yeah. if I may, is horny. That would be the canonical thirsty. The canonical thirst. Definition. Yeah. 
these things come up so quickly? <laughs> I don't know all these things. I think we should take some questions <laughs> from the audience. Um, maybe, if, I wonder how it would be the best to do this. You guys, oh, excellent. Sure, um, if people just want to raise their hands and, yes, sir. Oh, okay, sure, tell us. I find it very interesting that we've talked about speech and language, but so much of what happens in communications now is via video and images, photographs, photographs that are overlaid with all kinds of stupid little, stupid to me, uh, the little things that distort them in various ways. Maybe the question is why haven't you spoken about that in the interest of communication? I was actually going to make a snarky comment when um, we were discussing like text, the replacement of email with text, and I was going to say, no more text. Like now, everybody's Snapchatting. Yeah, that's you know, right. um, and the gifs slash gifs and and the memes, et cetera. It's ever more pictorial. That's definitely true. Yeah. I don't know if it's necessarily that the pictures are going to take over, but you could see it as a dynamic synergy between all these things. I kind of like the pictorial creativity, where you kind of have cave writing <laughs> meets rap in a way. But that's just me trying to be accepting. I don't know. Well, I mean, the whole development of emoji has been fascinating in that it's this, you know, these little pictographs, basically, which shouldn't, you know, on the face of it, have necessarily been as successful as they've been because um, you just, you know, started with a very limited set. Of course, the Unicode consortium keeps expanding and adding new ones. Um, but once that became available to people on their iPhones, especially um, on, their, on their virtual keyboards, it became sort of a new tool in, in their arsenal. And, um, and so, you know, you can see this kind of, um, you, can, you can see this efflorescence of it where, um, where even though, you know, the, it doesn't seem like it should be something that could really develop organically, again, because um, you're, you know, there is some consortium out there that is actually deciding which little pictures you're allowed to use, and not to mention all of the difficulties where you don't even know if the emoji that you're using will appear the same on the device that it's being received on, um, uh, means that uh, it's sort of fraught with all these sort of uh, ambiguities and so forth. Um, and yet it's been fascinating just to see just how successful it's been. Um, certainly in, in the future, there are gonna be more of these sort of you know combinations of text and picture and voice in some combination and those graphic elements where people are having fun with it, um, you know, I, I, you know uh, but I think the tech companies are trying to figure out how can we best exploit people's sort of um, impulse to express themselves um, graphically, pictorially. I mean, if you think also about the like, yeah, the animated GIF, for instance, I mean, this, in some ways that's like old, online technology that keeps, you know, people keep holding on to that animated GIF um, uh, because, you know, you can just plop it into, you know, uh, whatever, you know, tweet or whatever you're, whatever you're, and it, it almost, at this point, I mean, has this kind of like low tech appeal to it. Um, uh, it can be something kind of grainy and it's just, you know, um, uh, but, but, but it adds an extra element that, that, uh, that you know, that, takes text and you know, moves it somewhere else, or again, can be a kind of a meta commentary on what you're talking about, a reaction, you're sort of providing your own reaction. And so that's what I, you know, what I see all of that happening, but, and we haven't, yeah, I mean, we, we haven't talked, we've been focusing mostly just on the sort of the textual side of it. There's this more graphic element. And then, you know, the combination with, with voice, I mean, I mean, if we're talking about the things that, um, that are really going to be dominating in the future. It, it's going to be much more about sort of voice technology and how, and how we use that. And now we're, we're, you know, as obviously anyone who's interacted with Alexa or Siri or Cortana or, you know, one of these digital assistants, um, you know, that's where the tech companies are focusing all of their work on like natural language processing and things like that. Um, where, um, you know, we'll look back on these days, it's like, you know, oh, you know, they were using, <laughs> they, they were texting, that just seems so, so old fashioned when, you know, sort of voice and picture uh, may be the primary modes in the future.
of its own, which essentially has infinite possibilities and computing has infinite possibilities. So I'm really interested in what all of you might have to say, <coughs> hopefully in the right say, uh, about that because, you know, I, whether it's voice, whether it's facial recognition, whether it's image recognition, I, I tend to be on the cutting edge and the fact that people are just now talking about natural user interfaces, uh, I don't even think they're very natural. I think they're calling them that. But everyone as a whole, society, has a negative connotation because when they call their insurance company or airline, they have a bad experience. And that's because that's a bad voice user interface. And there was even a study done with an airline where they tried using an app to let people check if their flight was late or not. And that actually succeeded, whereas their call-in thing failed. So even though we're clearly gonna get more and more voice user interfaces that are both guided by you and or only can tell keywords like yes or no, I don't wanna get into the like linguistics of it. What about the actual technology being not even just a language, but possibly like a meta language, something that can be used for different languages? I think when you get into the sort of things that you're talking about, which are very interesting in themselves, a linguist would say that there's a stretching of the very essence of what you might consider a language to be. The, the three primary elements of what, for example, human language is would be shared attention. Without shared attention, there's no language. A capacity for associating arbitrary symbols with concepts, and then sharing of ideas. If you're not focusing shared attention upon using arbitrary symbols to share ideas, then that's a different kind of language than what there was. And so I think we might even need a new word for what was going on with the bits and the bytes and the mistakes that they're making or the networks <coughs> that they're coming up with. That's linguist to me, and I'm used to that particular blob as applying to what I call language. Maybe I could extend myself into thinking of language as something else. You know what I mean? Well, like, okay, so first thing, it, the, there's the three things um, that, right. that, okay, so the first is shared attention. Right. You have to so be, code, right, like code, right. which they call languages, there's Python, there's HTML, there's like a gazillion different languages. Um, it's creating something which I guess um, is a sort of, it, its manifestation is something that which we share, we, which we, we other, multiple people focus on, but it's like the, the language itself, the words itself aren't what we're focusing on. It's like the, um, the mirage or the illusion or the, um, what, the, what the language creates. Like anything we look at online is comprised of that language, but it's just right. we, it, we're not looking at the, wor at the um, code itself. We're not seeing it. So it's kind of, it's interesting. It's like a more covert language underlying everything that we're looking at online. So the code is allowing language. But the code but is the, a language, right. The, but the code, from what you're saying, is the code itself a language under this definition? That's a genuine question. I think the code is a language. Okay. I think the code is a language. Um, yeah. Okay. To me it is, because it's, um, it's creating spaces where, where there can be shared attention. And what, what were the other well, two? Shared attention, arbitrary symbols, and then exchanging ideas. Right, and which is definitely. What, whatever you're going to do with the ideas is a different subject, but exchanging ideas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And also it's a code, it's a language amongst coders too, so that things can have a uniformity, like in the way that, um, you know, there's a signifier of something, like when I say apple point to an apple, it means apple to me, it means apple to you. I think that's why there's also a language amongst coders so that they can um, so identify. So those are, those are languages, that kind of coding. Yes. I think the audience member might mean something else, broader. I not only agree that 
that just to, you know, to take Watson as, in, as an example of the, the promise that uh, we are often sold uh, nowadays with artificial intelligence um, as being um, a way that computers are now supposedly um, having a kind of a comprehension of language. And the way that if you watch commercials that seem to be endlessly on these days about Watson, um, having these seemingly human interactions with Serena Williams or whoever. Um, you know, you're, it, in a way, it's, it's constantly irritating to me to see the way that, you know, because we have certain preconceptions of the way that, uh, whether it's HAL in 2001 or other science fiction depictions of artificial intelligence, whether it's in the movie Her, for instance, um, and what our expectations are, um, and what, what is actually being delivered, I would say that Watson is a very, you know, very useful for various things. It was built as this kind of, to master this kind of question answering task. And on Jeopardy, that's exactly what you need. If you have a, you know, big enough sort of database of information and you can extract information, um, you can do that question answering task very well. And there are all sorts of other applications we might be able to use that for, helping doctors diagnose cancer or whatever they want to do with it. Right, that's, uh, that's why I brought up that example. But the, the, um, the, the uh, expression of uh, Watson as this sort of you know, sentient uh, creature um, is, uh, I think, playing into our preconceptions of what, you know, what we think um, you know, an artificial intelligence uh, should be like. It's fascinating to see what's happening these days, for instance, with chatbots, for instance, um, where, you know, there are lots of very interesting developments that are going on with, you know, providing certain services, very sort of limited roles like Watson that can be played, certain tasks that can be done um, by talking to, you know, talking to a machine, basically. Um, and actually, sometimes uh, in some of these, you know, applications of AI like chatbot, what you're actually getting is human-assisted AI so that it's, um, it's a machine that's programmed to sound like a human, but it might be getting some help from a human who is sort of behind the scenes and helping out. So it's a human acting like a machine, acting like a human. You get into these very, <laughs> very odd things. But, um, but uh, I mean, I, I think that uh, what we see in, uh, in terms of developments of that in the future, too, is that we're reaching a point um, uh, where um, with chatbots and things like that, which might in some cases, you know, pass the Turing test, seem like you're interacting with a human on the other end, but not quite. And that not quite leads us to a situation, you know, we talk about the, like, the uncanny valley. It's like, if it's just slightly off, it can be very disconcerting, maybe even horrifying. Uh, if you're having an interaction with, with something that you assume is a human at the other end, and then you realize it's, you realize it's not. Um, and in some ways, I prefer a kind of more artificiality to my interactions with a digital assistant or anything like that, um, so that we can sort of maintain that divide and you know, we don't have to worry about that uncanny valley problem. I mean, who among us has not been engaged with, in conversation and then suddenly realized that the person you thought you were talking to is not human? Um, <laughs> and so actually, can we? In real life. Um, yes, uh, you in the black. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
maybe even on a biological instead of a level, because I feel like these are the beginnings of human 2.0, um, when we are getting rid of these, um, these kind of um, um, characteristics that I feel are very essential to who we are as human beings now. What if we, over time, diminish that? Are we already seeing the beginnings of um, human 2.0, whatever you want? Um, extended argument, um, long arc argument, is not natural. That is not what humans are hardwired for. We're hardwired to have choppy conversation about one thing at a time and to make a case with seven bullet points and various moreovers and howevers. That's something that's largely only possible when there's writing. And writing didn't come along in humanity until, if humanity had only existed for 24 hours until after 11 o'clock PM. So the natural thing is not, frankly, to dig deep in the way that you're saying. What human people do, human people as opposed to other people, is <laughs> they chat at one another. And to the extent that you go deep, it would happen very gradually. <laughs> And it wouldn't be about many things. I don't mean that human beings aren't intelligent, but the long argument is a latterly artifice. That is threatened, I think, in our modern culture because we're more and more oral and we're taking in writing in smaller bits. Now, you can idealize how many people were really taking in long form arguments in 1906, but you get the feeling it's gonna be many fewer in 2026 because of the nature of the technology and how hard it is to pay attention to anything for very long. The only way I think we can assuage ourselves is that it's not as if human beings weren't that way before. There was maybe a brief shining moment when the long arc argument had a certain primacy. You could call it, I hate to say, education, but it's gonna be harder and harder to sustain attention upon this digging deep that you're talking about. I'm not sure what to do about that. Well, we've, we've managed not to talk too much about politics, but it just feels like the transition from the Obama era to the Trump era is, uh, it certainly feels like there's been a kind of a, a shift in what is prized discursively and the fact that Trump readily acknowledges, you know, he owes his presidency to Twitter. Um, he said, you know, something, to that extent. The fact that he's, he's able to package these little, you know, bombs uh, that, <laughs> that he can put out <laughs> into the world, 140 characters at a time, uh, which have this ridiculously outsized importance so that we're still talking about a tweet that, uh, you know, from a few weeks ago about, uh, you know, wiretapping and, and and making jokes about him misspelling tap or whatever, you know, just the way that um, one single message like that can have this kind of outsized importance and he has absolutely no interest whatsoever in, in any, um, you know, long rumination on a particular topic. He has a very short attention span. And so with that now as a kind of a political model uh, for our discourse, that in some ways reflects the changes that have been going on in terms of these sort of more, you know, just bursts, bursts of communication rather than, uh, you know, a thoughtful rumination on a particular policy topic and that sort of thing. I mean, it does give you pause to think, is this, are we on the cusp of, of uh, more serious change or is this just something, because we're so caught up in the moment, this sort of political moment, um, we may be sort of giving it uh, perhaps more significance than uh, it deserves. No, I think, it, I think we're stuck with it for good. If, if Richard Nixon could have sent out tweets in 1960, he would have won. It's really a matter of what the technology allows. And Trump happened to come along at a time when he could do that. And when you could see him online speaking with his one sentence, thoughts and with his savory ways of putting things, little Marco, believe me, all of that appealed not to a uniquely insensate electorate, it was ordinary. That's the way people have always been. But there was a time when you would never hear a presidential candidate speaking that way. The smoke-filled room tended to 
filter people like that out. And so it seemed as if things had improved, but really all it was going to take was the invention of something like Twitter for someone like Trump, who's not interested in oratory. I don't find him extremely inarticulate. He's normal. But for someone like that, he doesn't even have to try. And yeah, he can become president. We will see more of that. It's going to be a very interesting 50 years. <laughs> but if I, if I understand your concern just really quickly, it's not even just that he is not engaging um, in long ideas, or, or, but he, but you're saying that the way that we talk now sort of favors the talker over the listener, and that there is not really a way to respond. And I actually, I take issue with that. I think like it's a compelling vision, but maybe not an accurate one, and that actually we have more um, opportunity to talk back, to respond, to like bring more voices into the conversation than we ever have before. And so that might be another reason for hope. Um, just, you know, yes, we tweet into the abyss, but then the abyss tweets back. And if you, <laughs> if you ever check your mentions after you've published a piece about Trump, for instance, um, hypothetically, you will see that the <laughs> void is tweeting um, very loudly. So, so I do think that actually um, we haven't become less, less interested in dialogue. Actually, dialogue seems to be elevated um, in a way that it didn't used to be in the, in the era of smoke-filled rooms. And that's something that at least encourages me um, yeah. Go ahead, John. <laughs> <laughs> Very quickly, it's that usually, in my experience, they're not an hour. They're, they're relatively short. And listening through the ear takes less concentration than taking something in through the eye, especially for most people. And my intuition is that most people listen to podcasts while doing something else. They're going to work or they're doing the laundry. And so, I think of it as demanding less of the attention span for most listeners than reading a book. To be perfectly honest, I do a podcast, but I don't listen to them because I'm kind of a readaholic, and so I don't know. But from the feedback that I get from my listeners, all three or four, I get the feeling that <laughs> it's a they, very good podcast. <laughs> they are well, thank you. They are listening in a way that takes less strenuous effort than curling up with nonfiction pages. Ben, what do you? Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the beauty of podcasts is I think there are so many different kinds now. And so that part of the appeal is you can find your niche just like so much in kind of uh, online culture, whatever you're interested in, you're going to find other people who are interested. If you want to hear, you know, stand-up comics uh, talk about their troubled upbringing or something like that, then you can hear plenty of that. Is uh, podcast for that? Uh, <laughs> several. <laughs> I'll be ten. Every stand-up comic has one. Uh, um, but, or if you want to learn about something interesting about language, then you can listen to a half hour or so about that. I, I think it is true that it helps that it's something that you can consume while commuting or doing something else. And so that, that allows it to sort of um, override our short attention spans. Um, but I think it also shows, especially in ones that are sort of set up more as a kind of a, a conversation, um, you know, we still have, you know, we still have that, um, you know, real desire for insights that you can only get after, you know, really sort of feeling comfortable with another person and sort of digging deep. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that goes against whatever trend we might be talking about in terms of sort of the, the superficiality of discourse. I think that, that, that there still is very much, pe people do want to sort of find out things in more depth and more detail, get caught up in a story, get caught up in you know, the details of an interesting person's life, or get caught up in just the details of some interesting linguistic issue, just as an example. Random example, yeah. <laughs> so I, that, you know, that's a good sign. And, but I think, yeah, it, it, um, 
perhaps, yeah, it is easier to do that through the ear uh, these days than, um, than devoting the time to read a long piece in the New Yorker or something like that because it can accompany other activities and it, we can, it can just sort of seep into your consciousness uh, as you're going about your day. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question. You look so eager um, in the glasses. <laughs> um, yeah, so one thing that I just picked up on that Ben said a couple minutes ago was about Trump and nativism and one might say linguistic nationalism. Um, we talked about sort of nonverbal language, also about the language of technology. But one thing that we haven't really addressed is non-English language, non-American language, as it were. Um, right now, we're exposed to so many different languages out there in the world. So I'm just sort of curious and mystified by the fact that the only non-English word that we've heard during this conversation was onwards, which was Trump's you know, famous insertion of this. Onwards. Emoji is a Japanese word, but OK. <laughs> um, and so I'm just sort of fascinated by how sort of American-centric and English-centric this conversation was when language was really so much broader. Obviously, the internet is very English-centric in and of itself. Um, but I'm just curious to hear your take on the opportunities to reach out into other languages rather than just sort of English Touche. Point taken. Um, <laughs> and I would just say that a lot, of, a lot of what's happening that's very exciting these days in the field of natural language processing has to do with automatic translation, um, the strides that have been made in the sort of more statistical methods that have allowed things like Google Translate to get pretty darn good in a lot of different languages um, beyond the expectations of a lot of people who thought that it would always be limited to just sort of figuring out the gist of something in another language. What also interests me when we're talking about sort of crossing that linguistic divide, translanguaging as some people call it, is that sometimes technology can certainly facilitate that. And, you know, automated translation is a great example of that. But it's interesting too how sometimes it throws up barriers. And you know, one thing I was just, I was hearing about from um, uh, Michelle McSweeney, who's now a research fellow at Columbia. You will and, hear her name, yeah. Yes. Now, she's, she's looked at um, texting among um, bilingual Spanish-English speakers um, in New York. And what's fascinating about that is um, that texting does not really encourage what um, bilingual speakers would normally be doing code switching, switching very easily back and forth between Spanish and English. Um, that kind of translanguaging that people do all, on the fly all the time if they are bilingual speakers or multilingual speakers becomes more difficult, currently at least, uh, with texting because you are using a particular dictionary or word list um, uh, that's associated with whatever messaging app or device you're using will use a particular dictionary for one language, a monolingual dictionary. So all of the autocomplete and, and auto-suggest and so forth that we uh, are used to only works in that kind of monolingual environment. And then you have to switch um, to another, you know, to switch, consciously switch from English to Spanish or else just disable that entirely. Um, and so bilingual speakers from, from this study it are actually not doing as much code switching by far that they would just in, in their regular speech. And so that's an interesting way that um, because of the way the technology is created, not really taking into account bilingual or multilingual speakers as their use cases, um, it's something that I think that will be, continue to be a challenge as the world becomes sort of more globalized and multilingual um, in order to accommodate the kind of the, that kind of linguistic diversity in a serious way, when too often I think our technology uh, is made by people who have this kind of monolingual American English view of things. We can see that too, obviously, with um, digital assistants having trouble with, uh, with even just other accents, you know, other dialectal variation in English, let alone dealing with other languages. You know, I would add to that that um Modern technology makes it easier than it's ever been to learn 
uh, foreign language. I mean, there was a time when you had to use books and records and cassettes in your house. When, I left, you when I left my house, my 10-year-old son was learning French on Duolingo just for the heck of it. So, yeah. See, that couldn't be, you know, 10, 15 years ago. But I'm going to say the wrong thing, but I, it, it's not the wrong thing if you, just, if you just hear me out. On the one hand, we in this room can say now we can learn Mandarin. And you can. I'm trying to teach myself, and I've got it, you know, all sorts of stuff in my phone. But, you know, the truth is, no matter how much you listen to it, if you're over about the age of 13 and you're an English speaker, Mandarin is hard. And even if you do manage to be able to say anything other than hello and the book is read, then you have to learn to read it. And learning to read it is impossible. So, on the other hand, given that there is a universal language in this world, and it's not fair, but we're using it. It's English. English took it. That's not going to change. It's not going to be Mandarin. Even if more people speak Mandarin than English, the language that everybody uses is going to be English. It's easier. Now, with this technology, it will be easier for people to have access to that language who need it. And I think that's a good thing, too. It's not that I think that English is a mighty, wonderful tongue that has, you know, bestridden the world because it was better than the others. But, you know, we're, here we are. And so if somebody is a rural third worlder and English would help them to make a living, now they can learn it on their phone instead of having to buy DVDs of movies and watch them over and over again in their house, et cetera. I think that's a, a great thing. The world needs a universal language. It kind of has one. And with this technology, everybody will have more access to it. And we can all teach ourselves Danish. But more to the point, more people will learn Esperanto, except it's English. All right, thank you so much for coming, everyone. This is great. Thank you, guys.